Silbert, uh, runs the Digital Currency Group, DCG. But he's kind of like the most diversified and knowledgeable person when it comes to cryptocurrencies. And I, I, I'm going to try to summarize what DCG does. Um, it holds, it invests in companies that are doing things related to virtual currencies. In how many companies? 130. 130 country, companies he's invested in. Then he has a fund where he's investing in five cryptocurrencies, right? Hmm? Which has a half billion dollars in market cap, more or less. Eight funds that have two billion. Okay, so there you go. I don't even know. But he's investing in currencies. And he also wholly owns three companies, Coinbase. And Coin Coindesk. Coindesk, yeah, whatever. They're all the same, right? <laughs> no, all different. No, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm not an expert. So we go. actually did talk in advance. We actually I know, but the other ones are, I'm getting close. Just give me the other yep. two. Yep. Genesis Trading. Yeah. And then Grayscale, our asset manager. So you're doing trading, you're, you're holding, and you're also investing in companies. So what would you say are the key things that this audience should understand about what's happening in cryptocurrencies that they probably don't understand or don't so, know? So DLD had me on stage um, in Germany. Steffi, what, what year was that? Is Steffi around? I don't know. Um, that one maybe it was 2013, 2014. And I talked about Bitcoin, and everybody was like, you know, that's weird and crazy, and you're probably a criminal. Um, and maybe that's all right, still. Um, and, and I th but I think a lot's changed. And so um, show of hands, here, here, who has crypto? Who owns crypto? Any form of crypto? Yeah, so it's a friendly audience. Fantastic. So I don't need to tell you what Bitcoin is. Um, I, would, I think what's happening behind the scenes that I think a few people don't appreciate um, is if you were to watch CNBC, it kind of feels like everybody is in on this asset class, We've had a bubble, the bubbles burst, and um, it's only idiots that are hanging on. And what we actually see behind the scenes um, is, a, one, a recognition that digital currency is here to stay. May or may not be Bitcoin, but digital currency is here to stay. Uh, a recognition that this is actually kind of something that's good for society. Innovation's happening, jobs are being created. And from an investment perspective, institutional money has not put one dollar in yet. It's really been, it's been retail investors, it's been family offices, but the, the, the deep pools of capital um, that could propel Bitcoin and digital currency to the next level haven't even started investing. And, and why is that? Well, why have they not started investing? Yeah. Um, I think part of it is um, the kind of the, the perception. If you're a criminal, of, no. Well, like, look, I mean, there's a perception that, um, that, that there's a headline risk, yeah. but I can assure you that as soon as the Goldmans of the world launch their trading desks or you know, XYZ big fund or sovereign wealth fund puts money into it, they'll have the air cover to start putting money to work. And so we- And with that's our, gonna happen. It's absolutely gonna happen. Um, it's really just a matter of when. So, so the institutions are sitting there waiting for that, or they don't know they're sitting there waiting no, for that? I think a lot of them are digging in. A lot of them are trying to figure out where do you buy it. Um, they're trying to figure out how do you store it. Custody is still a big issue. Um, and they're coming up with their investment strategies right now. And, and I do think that um, it'll start slow. You'll start seeing some headlines of, of money being allocated in, and then there's going to be a tidal wave. Tidal wave of capital is going to flow in, and I would say that at some point in the future, a year from now, three years from now, the conversation is not going to be, is this a real asset class? Is this something we should be doing? It's going to be a conversation around what is the appropriate allocation of a portfolio into digital currency? Okay, yeah, but the question is into what? I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. there's Bitcoin, which, you know, everybody has heard about, and that's probably what most people here own or maybe not but then there's how many other thousand at least two thousand yeah. at least two thousand digital currencies yeah. Yeah. okay so when that happens what would you guess will be where the money goes into and will it be Bitcoin primarily or not Bitcoin primarily well you'll notice my company is called digital currency group not Bitcoin blog group um, and that's because I'm the first to admit it's super early um, and if you look at the landscape of cryptocurrencies out there, uh, I would say that 99% of them are going to go to zero. Um, and the ones that we like, the ones that we actually have our money in, we have about half a, about half a billion dollars of our own money. In We have a Bitcoin, we have Ethereum Classic, we have something called Zcash, we have something called Zencash, and then the one that we're really excited about now is something called Decentraland. Okay, well, let's get to Decentraland in a minute. But so... 
you do have some Bitcoin. What percentage of that half billion would so be I, I Bitcoin? Keep, would I keep you fifty percent in Bitcoin. Yeah, and then the other fifty. Fifty five zero. Yeah. Okay, and so you're still a big believer. Yeah, Bitcoin. Look, Bitcoin is it's digital gold. It's the kind of the it's the main currency that through which people trade in and out of the other ones. Yeah. Um, and it's the one that I can articulate an actual investment thesis better than anything else. It's it's digital gold. There's seven trillion dollars of gold in the world today. The younger generation doesn't value gold like our parents and grandparents did. Some percentage of that seven trillion is going to move into digital currency, and I think Bitcoin. The question is how much? Okay, so why he has more expensive jeans perhaps than he used to, he bought $150,000 worth of Bitcoin at $10. Personally, right? Is that that's a public fact, right? So that's when he that's why he thinks it's a good investment, obviously. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I am talking my book. I, I, I will admit that too. Yeah, so so, and let's talk about those other two, Zcash and Zencash. Zen, yeah. Why are those in your very limited portfolio, and what do they represent that's different? Because you have a good explanation of that. So there's a new cohort of these um, digital currencies that are coming out that are private, privacy focused. So I think a lot of people um, are under the impression that Bitcoin is anonymous. And, and the truth is, is um, it's actually very easy to trace the movement of the Bitcoin transactions around the network. And you know, by and large, bad people are not using uh, Bitcoin to do bad things. Um, so I do believe that because they could get caught, they will. Yeah, because they will get caught. Um, they're they're better off using hundred dollar bills or whatever they use. So um, so I believe now and more so in the future, financial privacy is going to become um, a really really important um, um, uh, characteristic that people are going to look for in their money. Uh, and so there's this new cohort of tokens that have come out, which make it um, virtually impossible to follow the money as it moves around the system. And so the first one was called Zcash, something we're very excited about. And then there's a new version, something called Zencash. And of course, the first thing that everybody's probably thinking of is the bad guys are going to use it to bad, do bad things. And I would say that may be right, um, but bad people use cash and mobile phones and cars to do bad things, and no one talks about um, banning those types of things. So. The reason why I do think there's a real opportunity for these privacy-focused tokens is because there is $10 trillion of offshore wealth today held around the world. Um, and I do think that the ability to hold some of your net worth, um, let's call it off the grid, um, is a right that everybody should have, especially in markets where you don't have um, you know, bank accounts or, or, or trust in your government. So $10 trillion held in offshore bank accounts these two digital currencies are you know, worth collectively a billion dollars. If you do the math and you say, okay, some portion of 10 trillion is going to go into something worth 1 billion, it creates a really... Because you think those two really are the ones that could do it? Today, yes. And, and, but is this a tool that would be just good for some rich person in Albania or, I don't know, Gabon? Or is this for like the ordinary citizen of Gabon who wants to, who doesn't have access to good banking? And I mean, are we going? Are ordinary people going to benefit from that, or just rich people? I guess is what I'm asking. I like to think ordinary people because all you need is a mobile device. So if you have a mobile device, you can get access to any of these digital currencies. And you know, in markets where you have both kind of no <coughs> no established banking system, or really where currencies are losing value. Look at Venezuela. You know, Zcash has taken off in Venezuela right now because people want to own anything other than the Bolivar. Mm. And that's, that's, that's pretty, that, I think that's pretty exciting. Yeah, that is interesting. Okay, so the fifth one is MANA. Now, you want to tell us what that is, and then we'll get into that. Yeah, so Decentraland. Okay, so has anybody here well, heard? Tell, explain the connection, or maybe you yeah, don't so, want to. So yeah, so MANA is the currency that's in Decentraland. Has anybody heard of Decentraland? All right, we have one per... Uh, two oh, there's people. somebody over here. Okay, great. So um, in the DLD highlight reels in five years, when this is huge, Steffi can say you heard about it here first. Okay, so Decentraland um, is a decentralized metaverse. Uh, so anybody who has read Snow Crash or Ready Player One saw the movie um, or remember Second Life, which is still around, um, Decentraland is a decentralized version of that. The difference being... The world is finite in, in size. Um, it's the size of Washington, D.C. right now. And it has an in-world cryptocurrency called MANA. And that MANA 
is finite in supply as well. And it's used VR as the way you navigate it. Yeah, so when this world launches later this year, you'll be able to navigate it via both actually web and VR. And so it's kind of crypto plus VR, you know, second life. And th you know, the reason why I'm so excited about it is because I fundamentally believe that the virtual world, the metaverse, is going to exist in the future. Um, you know, the world that was envisioned in Snow Crash or Ready Player One is going to happen. Um, people play, spend a lot of time, you know, doing games, playing games, getting involved in these immersive type um, experiences. And I, but I do believe that if there is going to be a world, that world cannot be owned by one company. It cannot be owned by Facebook, it cannot be owned by Google. And so having a decentralized world that can serve as a platform on which these experiences could be built, I think is incredibly exciting. Um, and based on the conversations that we've had over the past six months since we first got involved, um, I think that, that this may be um, the, the killer app for both uh, VR and, and crypto. Okay, well, explain both those last things in, in more detail because and, and also, maybe that's connected to why one company shouldn't own it, because I'm not exactly sure what it is that one company shouldn't own and that this will instead be. So explain right. that. Well, so I think, um, I think the risk of a company owning the metaverse. So do you, you want to say the what? metaverse. You so you think this will be the metaverse yes. in, in some sense? Yeah. So if everybody, assuming everybody understands what the metaverse why is. Why don't you describe it as, in as um, few words as possible? It, it, virtual world. It, it's a, it, it is a virtual world that um, is all, you know, basically... It exists virtually, but its its experiences and its design, um, you know, may look a lot like New York City or the world, or it may it might not. Um, and that's also what's so exciting about and it. And VR will allow us to really experience it in full, you know, depth of field, and like not like we did Second Life to the degree we experienced that. Exactly, exactly. And so what's happened over the past six months is you've seen there's 90,000 parcels of land that were created. Each parcel of land is 10 by 10 meters. Two parcels is the size of a tennis court. And, and so if you kind of go, you'll find this online, there's, you can find a map. The, there's, um, of the 90,000 parcels, um, 60,000 60, about have been sold um, as for as high as $60,000 right at the center. So the expectation is, is when you enter this world, you're going to jump it, you're going to drop into the middle. And so people have been speculating that right around the center is going to be the Fifth Avenue um, of, of the metaverse. Um, and so I've had a lot of conversations now with content creators, with, enter with, with movie studios, with gaming companies, and, and you know, what I've come to appreciate is if the metaverse becomes a thing, if VR becomes a thing, when you want to go discover experiences, you're not going to go to Google and type in, show me the cool VR experiences. You're going to put on your goggles, and you're going to drop into the world, and you're going you're gonna to bump into things. So it becomes a search engine for VR, in, in a sense. Search engine and platform. Yeah. Okay, but go back to why it's the killer app for both VR. That's sort of the killer app for VR an answer. But what about the killer app for crypto? Well, the other reason why it's also a potential killer app for VR is because it creates a monetization opportunity for both hardware developers as well as VR content creators. Because you could theoretically charge people to go experience whatever it is you're building in, in Decentraland. So right now, there's a casino district. There's a university district. There's a fashion district. There's um, This isn't operative yet, by the way, despite all these things being there. Yeah, yeah. Right? It's still in development mode, and nobody's even interacting in there until when? December? Is that end of this year is when they're going to... Uh, right now, you, people are building experiences, um, but you'll be able to drop in at the end of, of the world. So the reason... Uh, at the end of the year. Um, <laughs> well... <laughs> At least there'll be an alternative. Yes. Um, yes. Um, so, okay, so, so the reason why I think it might be a killer app for VR is because it creates a way to monetize the hardware and the software. So if you think about, like, think, let's think about a Samsung or, a, or an Oculus. They could potentially give away these goggles for free and monetize it either through being owners of mana or owners of land or creators of experiences within these worlds. So that's kind of interesting. I think on the crypto side, the reason why it might be a killer app um, is because, it, one, it's, it's fun. Like so much of what's happened in the crypto space over the past eight years has been about kind of making money. This is, this is fun. Like I'm really, uh, the, the reaction that I'm getting from people um, to this reminds me of the early days of Bitcoin in 2011 when I started getting excited about it. So I think that it, it creates 
real utility for a digital form of money beyond just speculation. But the only way you'll be able to spend money in it is to use mana, which is one of the reasons you're loading up on that now. But in other words, that's, it sort of forces you to use crypto, but also crypto is a very useful tool to make it work, in effect. So you appreciate yeah. um, the, the Facebook effect. Um, so if you think about kind of the network effect, uh, the, one of the reasons why I think Bitcoin took off the way it did is because essentially there was network effects, uh, there was network effects of money. Well, with Decentraland, people who own the land, people who own the mana, um, they can't shut up about it. I can't shut up about it. And so you have this, this situation where you have the one plus one, I believe equals five. Okay, we've got to wrap because it went to zero unexpectedly, but what, <laughs> if anybody in here wants to pursue it further, is there anything they can do now, or do they have to wait to the end of the year, or what? So I would start off by saying, don't put more, mo more money into it than you can afford to lose, because it's more likely going to zero than it is going up. Um, I would say... I mean mana. But I mean, I mean crypt in, in Decentraland, or which is going to be yeah. renamed, by the way. Yeah. But yeah. that's what you don't put money in, because that's going to no, no, go no, to zero? No. Wait. For all the crypto stuff? All the crypto. Be careful. Yes. Okay. My, my big flashing... Talk yeah. while you're standing up, because okay. we have to go. But, <laughs> but I, I meant particularly the last thing, you know. This decentral land, which is going to be renamed, but you made it sound so cool, people can't stop talking about it, but is there any way these people could get involved now? Yes, there's an active uh, uh, community. Um, there's Twitter to follow. There's a website to go to. Sign up. You'll, you'll see it's very easy to engage and learn about what's happening and get involved. Uh, there's so much to talk about. We didn't even talk about blockchain and other stuff. But Next time. He, he's a font. We, but it's interesting how excited you are about Decentraland. So it's, he's invested in it. Thank you so much, Barry. My pleasure. Um.